Welcome everyone to our webinar on Deal Structures 101, um, Understanding Equity, Safes and Convertible Notes. My name is Sean McLaughlin and I'm a practice leader in Legal Vision's corporate team. I'm joined today by my colleague Ashton Cecil, who is also a lawyer in our corporate team. Um, before we begin, a couple of quick housekeeping items. So you will be emailed the webinar recording and slides afterwards. So um, you don't need to be taking super detailed notes while we speak. Um, next, please submit your questions uh, in the chat box. So down, it should be down to your right. Um, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar where we, where we will be answering as many questions as we can. And finally, please complete the survey after the webinar to let us know how you found the content of today. Um, also, all attendees are eligible to receive a free consultation with us to discuss how we can help you with your contracts or any of your legal needs. So to request your free consultation, please make sure you provide us with your contact details in the survey that appears at the end of, your, at the, end of the webinar. If you don't provide your contact details there, we won't be able to reach out to you to, have, to offer you that free complimentary consultation. So today we will be discussing, um, first of all, the best vehicle to raise funds. Um, next, um, we'll be going over the dual company structure. And then we'll turn to the different forms of funding. So first of all, loans, then equity, then convertible notes, and finally safes. And then lastly, we'll be going through the process. So for any, um, any the process for raising funds and what that looks like for you. And then we'll cap things off with the Q&A. So as we talked about at the end of the webinar, we'll be answering um, some of your questions. So please make sure you submit your questions throughout the webinar, throughout the chat function, and we'll answer them at the end. Um, and now we will, I will throw to Ashton, who will speak about the best vehicle to raise funds. Thanks, Sean. So the best and most industry standard vehicle to raise funds with is a company. And you can only issue shares or securities which are convertible into shares such as safes or convertible notes if you have a company. Now with companies, you can either just operate through a single company, like a single entity, or you can have a group structure which encompasses multiple interrelated companies. Now, even if you are just going to be raising capital, so raising through uh, debt, such as a loan, the company structure is still beneficial because your personal assets are generally going to be protected. Um, because companies are seen as their own like individuals and they are able to enjoy limited liability. So on to the next part, uh, we're looking at the most common group structure that are used in Australia to raise capital with, and that's the dual company structure. So with the dual company structure, you have a holding company with an operating company that sits underneath it. Your operating company is where you're going to be entering into contracts, so um, supplier contracts, um, you know, employment contracts, your lease with your landlord, for example, and your holding company is the company that's going to hold um, all the assets of value, such as your intellectual property and your cash, and this really is used to basically reduce your liability of where you're taking on most risk, which is at the operating company level. Now, as a founder, you're going to be holding your shares in the holding company, and you can either do that as an individual um, or through a family trust. And a lot of founders do use a family trust um, as it's beneficial from an asset protection perspective, and you can also uh, distribute income um, across your family um, from any of the income that's generated, uh, such as dividends from the shares. And on that note, we're going to hand over to Sean to discuss loans. Yeah, thank you, Ashton. So the first form of funding we're going to talk about is loans. Um, we're starting with loans because they're, they're often the most simplest instrument to understand. So um, most of you might have um, inter had in entered into a loan before. So just to outline, a loan is when someone lends you money and you promise to repay that money um, at some point in the future. So interest may or may not be payable on the loan, depending on what terms you can negotiate with your lender. Um, you might be required to repay the loan either in instalments, so maybe monthly instalments or quarterly instalments, 
or perhaps you've negotiated to be able to only repay it at the end, in which case we call that a balloon payment. So often, if certain events occur, so for example, if you go insolvent um, or if you don't make a repayment, the lender might have the right to accelerate the loan. And what this means is they can demand immediate repayment of the entire amount that is outstanding. Um, so you need to be aware of those terms in the contract before you enter into it. So the, when you're entering into the loan, a lender might want to take security over some of your assets. So this means if you default, the lender will have a direct right to take those assets and sell them um, if an event of default occurs. So those events we're talking about, maybe you go insolvent or maybe you fail to pay. Um, so you don't need to give security for a loan. Um, it just depends entirely on your relationship with the lender and, maybe, and often the financial uh, performance or position of your company. So depending on those factors, the lender might ask to take security um, over some or all of your assets. So a pro um, of entering into a loan in a form of fund, as a form of funding is that you don't have to give up ownership of your company. Um, and Ashton's gonna talk about this a little bit more when we talk about issuing equity or shares. Um, but under a, under a regular loan, you don't have to give up any ownership of your company. Um, one of the disadvantages of the loan is that you do have to repay the amount. So uh, you have to be, think about whether or not that your company can afford that from a cash flow perspective. So obviously your, your company needs the money now and that money is going to come into the company and you're going to spend that money. And so you just need to be aware, do you, will you have the cash flow to be able to repay that loan as and when it's due? If you're paying interest on the loan, you also need to think about whether or not you can afford to pay the interest on that loan before you enter into it. Um, following that, Ashton is now going to talk about another form of funding, um, which is issuing equity or shares. Thanks, Sean. So basically what shares are is they represent a fractional ownership of your company. And investors are going to agree to give you money or capital in return for a percentage holding of your company. So usually most investors are going to want to agree um, on it to provide you on a post money valuation of the company, which is taking into account the valuation and their investment. And so we're going to work through a simple uh, example, although I know a lot of you will have probably more complicated share structures and investment situations, but we're going to start simple. So in our example, we're going to assume that currently, as the founder, you hold 900 shares. Uh, your investor that you've been negotiating with wants 10% equity and you've negotiated a $1,000 post money valuation company. So to work this out, what you're going to do is you're going to take the 10% that they want of the company and you're going to times that by the number of shares on issue divided by one minus the percentage holding that they want. And that's ultimately going to that's going to equal 100 shares. So there's going to be 1,000 shares and they're going to have 100 of them, which equals 10%. Now, to calculate the share price, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the post money valuation and divide it by the number of shares that are currently on issue plus the number of shares that the investor will receive. So using our working example, that's going to be $1,000, which is the post money valuation, divided by the 900 founder shares plus the 100 investor shares, which is 1,000 divided by 1,000, which equals $1. So ultimately, our investor, our theoretical investor, is going to get um, $1 times 100 shares. They're going to invest $100 into the company. So moving on to another topic that is at the forefront of discussions about bringing on capital and for early stage companies generally which we help a lot of our clients with is the the esop which is the employee share option plan and now esops are common uh, mechanisms for early stage companies uh, which they basically are going to issue employees and or contractors options and those options can be converted to shares and the rationale for this is mainly that Basically, as an early stage company, you're not going to be able to offer competitive wages at market rate. So you're going to be issuing rather a, a lower wage with percentage ownership of the company. And another benefit of it as well is that 
it incentivizes the employees to perform because good performance by employees is good for the company, it increases the value of the company and it increases the value of everybody's shares. The other really good point about ESOPs is that um, there are tax benefits for employees provided that the company and the offers that are made to the employees meet certain criteria. Um, one of the main ones being is a capital gains tax discount. So ordinarily with your ESOP, how it's going to work is that you're going to be setting aside a pool. You usually do this in your shareholders agreement, which can be allocated to your employees. So usually with early stage startups, we see 10% pool and sometimes that would increase to about 20%. Now in the scheme of taking on investment and your capital raising journey, your investors are going to likely require you or expect to see your ESOP pull in place because ultimately it's going to help them calculate the dilution that they're going to experience if you were to issue um, options under your eShop, ESOP. Uh, so basically as an example, if we go to the next slide, um, we're looking here is the pie chart on the left is when you start your company, you're going to be usually you and your co-founders holding all the shares. And the idea is, is that on the second uh, pie chart on the right is that you're giving away a percentage of the pie, a piece of the pie, but the pie is larger than the pie on the right because everybody is working towards growing the company. And so even though you've diluted yourself and now you only hold 80%, that 80% is worth more than if you hadn't taken on investment and taken on employees and, and issued ESOP. And on to our next part, we're going to hand over to Sean to discuss another capital raising avenue being convertible notes. Thanks, Ashton. Yeah, so convertible notes are a very, um, a very common form of instrument that um, our clients use um, for funding. And we certainly help lots of clients put in convertible notes. Um, they've been particularly popular in the last couple of years um, when, um, you know, capital hasn't been, uh, equity raises haven't been as popular. Um, and so convertible notes are a form of debt instrument. So um, that means the as part of the instrument, the investor gives you money, um, but you do have an obligation um, to repay that. Um, either repaying it by redeeming the note in cash or converting the note into shares. Um, and those, those events happen, those trigger events happen um, either on maturity. So you might agree a point in time with your investor in the future, say three years in the future, or on a qualifying financing. So the whole idea of a convertible note usually is that the investors are investing on the assumption that you'll do an equity raise in the future and that hopefully the note will convert at that raise into shares. Um, the conversion rate, so the number of shares that the investor will get when a note converts, is generally calculated based on a discount to the issue price of shares in your next raise, if that's when the, if the note is, is converting as part of that raise. So it might, it might be either converting at a discount to the issue price, or we sometimes see clients also offering valuation caps. So um, that means that the conversion price is based on a pre-agreed valuation of the company. So even if at your raise, you're raising at 10 million, the note will convert as if the raise was say at 5 million, if that's your valuation cap. So the valuation cap is a predetermined theoretical company valuation, which you can use to calculate the share price on conversion. Um, and just a tip from us, which we often give to our clients, is you want to set your valuation cap as close to what you anticipate the valuation will be at the triggering event. So that is the qualifying financing, which, you know, which is your capital next capital raise. Um, so as I talked about, when you're determining the conversion mechanics, it might either be at a valuation cap or it might be at a discount rate. So the discount rate is applied to the share price as part of that next capital raise. Um, so discount rates we usually see, it's fairly standard to have about 20% discount rate. And so what this means is if in your next raise, um, you issue shares at a dollar, your note holder will get to convert its note at a discount of 20% to that dollar. So 
it's the invested amount will convert um, at a 20% discount to a dollar being 80 cents. So if the investor has invested $100, it gets to convert that $100 at 80 cents, meaning it gets 125 shares. So it's, uh, it's better off, 25 shares better off than it if it had just invested at that equity round um, at a dollar. And you're giving that discount to your investors because you're kind of acknowledging that they've come to you at an earlier stage when you're not, you've not yet hit the milestones that you might have hit by the time you come to a raise. And so um, one advantage you're giving to them as, as consideration for that is, is the discount or valuation cap, as we talked about, which you might agree with them. Um, interest may or may not be payable on your convertible note. Um, if interest is payable, it usually accrues, meaning you don't have to pay interest during the term of the note, but that interest amount will accrue and will form part of the um, principal amount that will um, convert at the conversion at the trigger event. Um, if you don't raise, um, so if you don't raise the convert, the convertible note will continue until again, the pre-agreed maturity date. And at the maturity date, the note will either convert or you might have negotiated that the investor has the right to redeem its note for cash. So the investor might say, I want you to pay me cash equal to the invested amount plus all the interest that's accrued on the note, or they might elect to convert their note um, into shares. Um, and you'll have to agree um, what that conversion will look like because you're obviously not doing as part of a raise. So you'll have to agree some kind of conversion mechanic to work out how many shares the investor will get at that time. So looking to the advantages and disadvantages of a con note. So the advantages of con note is it's cheaper and faster to document than an equity round, which is another reason why our clients really, really favor putting these kinds of instruments in. Um, the next is it can defer valuing the business between two equity rounds. So um, if your company is in a position where, um, you know, you just need a little bit of equity injected to hit certain milestones, um, we really recommend, you know, going down a convertible note route or as we'll talk about later, a safe um, rather than an equity round because it means that you can get the money in the door, you can achieve those milestones that you need to and put the company in a much better position and have a much higher value for when you come to do an equity round. So that's a huge benefit of the convertible note. But you know, in this respect, do like I, we do flag to our clients that, that you know, if you're including a valuation cap, you need to be mindful of that because that does, whilst it's not putting a value in your company now, it is like you are making an assumption about what the value might be in the future. Um, from an investor perspective, it's great price protection for them you know, the discount or the valuation cap is even better um, than a full ratchet anti-dilution on a down round um, with the company taking all the risk in that respect. Um, disadvantages, it can result in significant dilution for the existing shareholders if the discount or the valuation cap is not suitable. So again, we, you know, where we provide advice to our clients as to whether or not the terms that they have negotiated are suitable, particularly at the term sheet stage, you know, you really need to be coming to your lawyers um, before you sign the term sheet, because that's the chance that we have to provide input as to whether or not the terms are suitable, both for your company and um, in comparison to what is being offered in the market. Um, another disadvantage of the condo is the conversion mechanics can be a little bit difficult to understand. Again, that's something as we as lawyers, we can help talk you through about how those are gonna work for your company in the different scenarios. Um, there is also a maturity date, as we talked about, it isn't a debt instrument. So at maturity date, if you haven't raised, you're either obliged to repay the note or convert it, depending on what you've been able to negotiate with your, with your investor. Um, and also interest might be payable, which can be administratively burdensome for some companies, which is one of the reasons why when we're advising clients, we make sure that that interest is accruing and forming part of the um, invested amount, which will hopefully convert into shares. Um, and lastly, convertible notes can be considered a debt interest for ESVCLP purposes. And so just to explain that very long acronym for people who don't know, some funds will be considered ESVCLP. This is a certain type of um, investment fund that qualifies for certain tax concessions. And for those investment funds, 
um, sometimes they're not able to take that they're, they're not able to take on these types of instruments because they're considered debt. And again, we can provide you with guidance whether or not this is suitable depending on the investors that you're talking to. And um, next I'm going to get Ashton. Ashton will talk us through safes, which are very similar to con notes, but different in some respects. Thanks, Sean. So yeah, SAFES. Uh, SAFE stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. And as Sean said, they are very similar to convertible notes, except there's usually would be no interest component. And there's also generally no maturity date. Uh, so with a SAFE, the real, the main trigger uh, mechanics behind it, which is where you're most likely going to see it convert into shares, is upon entering into a future priced equity raise. And so if you never conduct that raise, the SAFE won't convert. But we do want to put one kind of uh, caveat on that, is that in the current economic cycle, we're seeing uh, increasingly people want to, investors wanting to see maturity dates in safes. And because of the reduced frequency of raises in the current economic cycle, investors increasingly wanting to ensure their investment will convert if the raise, uh, if the future priced equity raise hasn't happened within the expected uh, time frame. And now I'm going to pass back to Sean for the crux of Deal Structures 101, which is the process of the raise. <laughs> Thanks, Ashton. Yeah, so the process is obviously hugely important. And one thing we really wanted to outline to you today, because it's something um, that, you know, that often our clients don't um, have a full grasp of when they come to us. Um, but understanding the process, especially the timing, is really important to make sure that you're going to be able to um, have the money in the door when you expect to and be able to carry on business as you expect to. So in terms of timing, raises um, can take three to six months once you have found the investors. So um, that is a bit longer than some, some people expect when they first come to us. And so just giving you that notice now um, will hopefully help you um, make sure that you have enough runway and that you're starting this process um, as early as you can to make sure that you'll have enough cash in the business when you want to. Um, so the first step in the process is to get a term sheet, particularly for equity raises. You don't always need a term sheet for convertible notes um, or safe rounds um, and usually not for loans, but sometimes you can have them. But definitely for equity raises, we recommend signing up and signing on term sheet. This will outline um, all the key terms of the raise and make sure that the raise can uh, occur as efficiently as possible. So you're saving time up front by agreeing these key terms in this concise document. Please, please give your term sheet to a lawyer to review. Um, they can provide really helpful input um, onto, on what those terms should be and, and kind of give you guidance in terms of what, what, your, what risks your company is taking on by agreeing to those terms. Once a term is in a term sheet and that term sheet is signed, it is extremely hard to get out of. So that's why we really encourage our clients to come with us come to us with their term sheets as soon as they can. Once you've got the term sheet signed, you will enter the due diligence stage, or in some cases, the due diligence stage might have already been happening even before the term sheet is signed. Um, so the level of due diligence your investor will undertake varies depending on the size of the round and the nature of the investor. Um, so, you know, at a real base case, they're going to be looking at the company structure. So what Ash has talked about before in terms of the dual company structure, do you have that protections in place? Who are your existing shareholders? Um, or like, what does the existing shareholding look like? They might be interested in that kind of thing. And that's the kind of questions they might be asking. They're also going to be asking to see that all the IP that your company has is properly owned by the company. Um, and again, this is something that Legal Vision often help with um, as part of the capital raise, we help our members um, make sure that their house is in order, that all their corporate governance documents are set up, that all the IP is owned by the company. And that's something that we have a lot of experience doing and we help our clients with. Um, as I've talked about, some of those documents you'll need as part of the raise um, are your constitution, um, your shareholders deed, your subscription agreement, as well as a, um, some ancillary documents. So, Legal Vision can help you put in place, will help you negotiate and put in place all of these documents and make sure the terms in all of those documents are as beneficial for you as they can be. Um, at completion, the company will sign resolutions. You will need to update your members register. That's a really important document that lists out all your shareholders and when they acquired the shares and how many. Um, 
and you'll also be issuing the share certificates and very importantly, updating ASIC um, as to your new shareholders. Um, so that's the process um, from start to finish and Legal Vision, we're very experienced um, with this process and we help our clients, you know, end to end with the capital raise process, right from getting their house in order and signing the term sheet all the way through to completion. Um, now I will, that concludes the main part of our webinar. Um, so thank you all for listening. You might find our publication useful. We've got, if you scan the QR code there, that's our startup manual, which is a legal handbook for founders. Um, you can find this also in the handout section of the webinar panel, scanning the QR code on the screen. And also, uh, we have an upcoming event, uh, which is an area that's often overlooked, but really important, which is managing safety in an office environment. And so that's going to be at 11 a.m. Uh, on Thursday, 25th of May, and you can register using the link below. So um, we are going to get around to answering some of your questions shortly. Um, while you continue to submit them, we wanted to also just take a minute to tell you about Legal Vision's membership model. So Legal Vision's membership is a cost-effective alternative to have all your business as usual legal needs covered. For a fixed monthly fee, you not only receive um, certainty but you also include benefits such as unlimited document view which could include your commercial contracts um, unlimited consultations which means you can book in as many meetings as you want with your um, lawyers um, to discuss your needs such as your commercial contracts or any other really business as usual legal needs and so you know you can you can have unlimited consults with your lawyers in areas such as franchising um, corporate structuring your esops uh, employment agreements um, any of your business as usual needs. So your membership offers unlimited trademark registrations, which is also really useful for early stage companies um, and a lot of people in the tech space. Uh, and it's all for one reasonable monthly fee with the option to purchase extra credit towards capital raising transactions, which we do conduct on our hourly rates basis. So thanks for everyone for joining. Um, we're now gonna move on to the Q&A section of uh, our webinar. Ah, uh, thank you, Ashton. Um, cool, well, thank you so much um, for submitting your questions. Quite a few have come through, so thank you for that. Um, starting off, we've had a few questions um, come in um, regarding what's the best way to provide capital to the business using your own personal funds, um, whether, you, whether they should do it as a convertible loan um, or as a shareholder and the pros and cons of different approaches. Um, also really in this question is if you start a company with your own money and there are no in initial investors, should I treat it as equity investment or debt? Um, so just to um, uh, uh, answer that question. So when you incorporate your company, um, most likely uh, um, you will be the sole shareholder in that company. So it might be you, maybe other founders. So when you incorporate your company, you guys will you, you you will be the initial shareholders in the company. Your initial investment in the company, so you might choose to make an initial equity investment, or more commonly for lots of our clients, um, they might choose to just incorporate the company with a pretty nominal equity investment. So when you incorporate a company, you can start with shares with a price as low as a cent. So what we would generally recommend to our clients is to set up your company, issue you and your founders with shares for just a cent, so there's nominal equity in there. If you do want to kick money into your company, um, usually we recommend the best way to do that is in the form of a loan. So we can put in place a simple founder loan agreement for you under which you lend money to the company um, and the company is obliged to pay you back. So the benefit of doing that um, versus an equity investment um, is as I've talked about, when you incorporate your company, you're already going to be incorporating it with you either as a sole shareholder or, or joint shareholder with your other founders. So you already own all the company. So there's no advantage to you to keep issuing you yourself with shares. You're not going to increase your share ownership more than the 100% you already have. Um, whereas if you lend money to the company, and whereas if you lend money to the company, that means at least there is an obligation for the company to repay that money back to you in the future um, if the company can afford to do so. Um, so it's kind of providing some protection to yourself from a founder perspective to ensure that you can get that money back that you kicked in. Also really important, um, when you're repaid that money um, by 
repayment of a loan, it's not taxable because you've lent that money to the company and you're getting it back as a repayment under the loan. Whereas if you're getting a payment by way of a dividend or, or another kind of distribution, that's usually taxable at your personal tax rate. So from a tax perspective, it's also much more efficient and, and it makes sense given the nature of the funds that you're injecting into to have that characterised as a loan. Um, a convertible loan um, ca can be beneficial in terms of if you're expecting to bring on investors um, soon. It can, can, it's a way of kind of ensuring that um, you can maintain your shareholding. Um, having said that, um, you know, you as the founder, you're going to be deciding the terms of your raise. And so as part of that raise, if you didn't want to give up that interest to the other share, to the other investors, you would already negotiate at that stage. Having you acquire more interest in your company, again, as I've talked about, because you already own it 100%, doesn't make too much sense for a convertible loan. Um, and it would be pretty unusual to see from the investor's perspective. Just also following on that, I think someone's asked, you know, if you have put money into the startup, is it, you, will the invest, VC, your later investors in reimburse you or is it considered a sunk cost? Again, depends how you framed it. So if you framed it as a loan, the investors would respect that and, and expect you to get repaid. Um, versus if, if you just kicked money in and it's not really documented, um, investors probably not willing to reimburse you. Um, if you wanted to see, if you haven't let, done the formal loan agreement, but you did want to get some money back, you might seek to sell some of your shares to the incoming investor. That's called a, called a secondary sale. But just note that that kind of decision might, the investors might not look on that favourably if they see you trying to want to sell down more of your interest. They might question why you're wanting to sell out of your company, um, depending how much you're offering for sale. So just be mindful of that. Um, with that, I might throw to Ashton for the next question. Thanks. Um, so yeah, we've had a really good question come through in relation to structuring. Um, and the question is along the lines of having a currently a single priority limited company and asking whether at a later stage, um, whether you can introduce a dual company structure. And so this is a really good question. It's something that we help our clients out a lot through our um, consultation calls. And we also can generally help um, with the actual incorporation and all the documents that are needed. Is the, the short answer is yes. Um, whenever it comes to structuring, you're always advised to either book in a call with our tax team or with your own personal tax um, accountants. Uh, and the reason being is that if there's value in the company and you transfer shares, then usually that's a capital gains tax event. And there we advise to take tax advice on that because there are ways around it. Um, so ultimately is that the ideal position is to try and get everything uh, set up at an early stage where the company has minimal value, um, but it is something that we can always, that you always can do at a different stage. Thank you, Ashton. Um, great, we've had another um, question come through in terms of, um, is there any price protection for investors? So it depends on what you negotiate with them. So um, often if investors are, um, if you're offering them preference shares, there will be some price protection in there in terms of you might agree some anti-dilution provisions. So this means if you raise um, at a lower price down the track, then the amount of shares, the preference amount of shares that those preference shares will convert into, the amount of ordinary shares will be adjusted to reflect that lower share price. And so basically they get a higher number of shares given that you've now raised at a lower price and, and offered terms more favourable to those investors in the later round. Um, so again, that's something Legal Vision can provide guidance to you on in terms of what, um, what kind of anti-dilution protection you're willing to offer your investors and whether that's appropriate um, given your company and given what we're seeing in the market. Um, and next I might throw to uh, Ashton to answer the next question. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, so our next question is about uh, conducting a friends and family initial raise and whether it's um, typical to offer equity or a safe or convertible note. And, um, you know, when it comes to questions like this, uh, there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. Uh, really, what we do find is that a lot of um, the time it's easier, there's less negotiations in a friends and family round. Um, and a lot of startup founders do like to go down the safe route. Um, the reason being is that safes are 
a, just a simpler um, a simpler raise mechanism. Um, you really just need to do your corporate approvals, like a board resolution um, and a member's resolution, and then the safe. Um, compared to an equity raise, where you're going to need to also then um, enter in some kind of subscription agreement. You're going to need to issue the shares um, and update ASIC. And so, from a cost perspective and a time frame perspective, it's always easier to go for the safe route. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way. And um, a lot of founders do choose in their early raises and family and friends to go down the equity route. Yes, Ashton. And, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Next, someone's asked, um, can Y Combinator save templates be used in Australia? Um, so generally, uh, documents from other jurisdictions, so from US jurisdictions, aren't usually suitable to be used in Australia, um, mainly because the different jurisdictions have different um, regulatory requirements and requirements around securities. Um, but certainly we have safe templates that are very, um, like that are universally accepted in Australia. And so those are the ones that we would probably guide you to use if you're using your doing your raise in Australia and using Australian investors as those are those are the documents that your investors would be comfortable with. Um, and they are, you know, safe obviously originated in, in the US. So the templates are, are, are based on those ones and so have a lot of similarities, but they have been adapted um, so that they're suitable to use in the Australian context. Perfect. And uh, we have another question that's come in asking whether Legal Vision uh, offers assistance with intellectual property license uh, agreements. And uh, yeah, the answer is absolutely. Um, intellectual property assignments and um, agreements are something that's very commonplace for startups and it's something that we absolutely help with. And uh, there's also another element which is can we assist with international deals and um, generally, if the deal is occurring in Australia, so we can help, as in if you have foreign investors investing in an Australian company, then absolutely we can help. If um, the capital raise is happening in a company that's outside of Australia, then uh, we might have to refer to one of our partners or to our UK legal office if it's in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Thanks, Ashton. Um, someone's also just had a question um, whether or not it's appropriate for um, you to give your, if you're entering to a loan agreement, if it's appropriate to give that lender shareholding. Um, you know, I, my, our view, my view or my recommendation to my clients, because I've had this come up for a couple of my clients, is um, you, you don't, that's not a particularly attractive deal for the company for, to both like take money in and have the obligation to repay it back but also be required to issue them with shares. So that's not a very good deal for the company. It's not very common. So I would say, unless they're willing to give you, um, unless it's two separate forms of funding, so they're giving you the loan and they're giving you a, a, share, a shareholding investment, they're giving you a um, adequate value for the shares that they're investing in, that you're offering them, then I would say that that is not a good deal for the company and, and you probably shouldn't go down that route. Um, so that would be my, my tips on that. Um, next, um, Ashton, I think we have a question just um, on the best way to allocate shares to potential founders. Do we have an answer to that one? Yeah. Um, yeah, so when it comes to allocating shares to founders, um, it really is going to depend on the kind of situation. So often using our, in our membership, this is something that pops up when people book in at consults. Um, Really, it's going to depend, you know, on the situation. Um, if it's somebody who's coming on at a later stage, like once the company's already started, then we might um, look at advising to enter into a service agreement as well um, and potentially having their shares vest. Um, the reason being is that it's not really a good position to be in when you're kind of be capital raising to have a founder who's not involved at all with the company. So usually what we'd do is we'd have a vesting deed and that vesting deed means that over a period of time, their shares are going to be like released to them and it's going to incentivize them to stay with the company because as soon as they leave, they're going to lose a portion of their shares. So if you don't take on your another founder in the beginning and you do it later, we, we really do recommend that just to kind of make sure that investors are going to feel comfortable, um, really being that investors in, who invest in early stage companies are really investing in the founders. And so if a founder is missing an action, then it can impact investors' decisions. 
Thanks, Ashton. Um, we've also had a couple of questions come in regarding um, advice around gen generating valuations and also questions around what's the appropriate share price um, and, and amount of capital to raise for companies. So um, it, is, it is hugely company dependent. It depends on the size of your company, how long it's been going, and also in the industry it's in for all of these, all these elements. Um, I would, I would say, you know, um, as like a guiding, guiding principle, um, talk to other founders in your industry, um, see what, um, how they are valuing their company, how they're thinking about this question, and also kind of having open discussions with investors in terms of like what, what their feel is, um, based on what, on your company's performance. You know, different people use different metrics. I know there has been a trend away from, you know, pure, um, pure growth numbers to now looking more um, at revenue and also making sure that companies can, if they need to, um, reduce their costs to ensure that they can make a profit if they need to. So definitely the way that the industry is thinking about this has is, is sorry, is changing. Um, you know, as a but as a, yeah, so just talking to as many people as you can and kind of ascertaining like what they think is appropriate valuation for your company. And that valuation will obviously feed into the share price payable by your investor. So those two things are interlinked, like one, determining the value of your company, and that will ultimately determine the share price that the investor is willing to pay for your company as well. Um, but with regards to the raise, we always recommend to our clients when you're doing a raise, make sure you're not giving away more than 20% of your company, you know, particularly if it's your first round, um, you know, you're going to probably need to do quite a few rounds and each round you raise, you're going to be further diluted. Um, so don't, certainly don't be agreeing to give away more than 20% of your company in any, in any round. Um, if an investor is asking for that, our view is that is unreasonable. Um, and, you know, certainly sophisticated investors might look unfavorably on you if you're offering up more than 20% of your company. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, uh, next, we've got quite a, quite a few more questions. So thank you so much for sending them through. Um, just a reminder, if you do have really specific um, questions you want answered and if we don't get to them all, please make sure that you put your details in the survey at the end and we can set up a complimentary consultation for you and that's like of no cost and we can answer any further questions you have. Um, but with that, I might throw to Ashton, um, if Ashton, you'd like to answer any of the um, yeah. yeah, so we've got another good question here about safe convertible notes. Um, so what goes into deciding between a discount rate and or a valuation cap? So um, yeah, it's a really good question. It's, we, we would usually advise that you know, you wouldn't necessarily offer up a valuation cap, although they are very commonplace. So it's not something you should be scared of if an investor wants one. But um, kind of throwing back to a previous um, question that was about whether for a friends and family raise, it's better to do a safe or an equity is that one of the benefits of doing a safe raise is that you're delaying valuing your company. And that's something that early stage companies really struggle with because at that stage, you're probably just an idea, um, which you're going to be executing over a period of time. You might be um, not even have your minimum viable product yet. You might have no customers. And so putting a valuation on your company is something that a lot of startup founders really struggle with. So with the safe is that, you know, although you're delaying having to put a valuation on the company into the later stage when you do the triggering equity raise, putting a valuation cap can also stress out a little bit um, founders in the sense that you are kind of having to play around with the idea of what's the company going to be valued at um, when the when the safe note converts or the convertible note converts. So, um, you know, we always say is that if you can get away with the 20% discount, you should try it. Um, but uh, if not, the valuation cap isn't something to be scared of either. Great. Thanks, Ashton. Um, and we would answer one last question here. So someone just has a question um, in terms of, um, so this is, uh, if a holding company is set up in Singapore and the operating company is in Australia, what implications does this have in terms of legal tax and management? Um, and what if the investors from other countries invest into this holding company besides the Australian investor? So um, as you kind of highlighted in your question, um, one of the key considerations when you're setting up companies in different jurisdictions is the tax implications of doing so. 
So as soon as you set up a company in another jurisdiction, everything that company does will be taxed under that jurisdiction's tax laws. So that's what you need to be thinking about in terms of whether or not it's appropriate to set up a company in a different jurisdiction. Um, but certainly we, we have lots of clients that operate across um, different jurisdictions and we're able to effectively provide them um, legal services um, for all um, their um, matters affecting, um, you know, whether it be their Australian companies or Australian consumers. Um, and as Ashley talked about, we've also got offices in New Zealand and UK. So we're, we help across all those jurisdictions. And if we often have clients operating in um, other jurisdictions as well, and we've got referral partners there. So we help companies across a number of jurisdictions depending on their structure. Um, and, but it is, yeah, it is largely a tax driven question in terms of whether or not you want to be setting up subsidiaries um, in different jurisdictions. If you're raising at offshore, um, the, the raise um, mechanics are going to be dictated by that jurisdiction and so you'll be see, your, law, your lawyers in that jurisdiction will be helping you with the raise and guiding you through that process. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, after the webinar ends, a survey will pop up um, and you know, plenty of questions came through today. I'm so sorry we didn't have time to answer all of them. But if you have any other questions that, um, are, are, that you still want answered, please put your details in and we'll reach out for a complimentary consultation where we can address those questions in detail. Um, and so we would really appreciate it, even if you don't want a consultation, to complete the survey. Um, and, um, but yes, you know, obviously that, that offer is there and we would love to help you um, with your legal needs. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone.